1937. It was in 1937. My family were sharecroppers. And that year, our entire crop was taken for a $65 debt. And I knew nothing about law. I knew nothing about, didn't know how lawyers worked. But somehow, in my 10-year-old mind, I felt that a lawyer could stop this. What happened to my family inspired me to become a lawyer, and I've dedicated my life to making sure that legal counsel was available to those who, like my family at that time, had no legal counsel. Lawyers are ministers of the law. It is not something that's a privilege for those who can afford it. It's something that's a right of those who are citizens of this country. Legal aid represents the notion that one of the most conservative values that we've traditionally held in America, that people are equal before the law. We like to think of America as a very just society. And if you can't get a good lawyer, how much justice are you really going to get when you need it? I don't think it's as well understood that for a poor individual who cannot afford to hire a lawyer to get a divorce, to get a child support order, to finalize an adoption, has an enormous impact on that individual's life. We're trying to help a widow stay in her house. We're trying to solidify relationships between a child who's been abandoned and a caretaker so the child can go to school. There's still a lot of pride in people, no matter how much money they have. There are people who have every reason to want to give up because they've dealt with so many challenges and so many hardships, but yet they continue to push forward and they continue to respect and, and hope that the law will be there to protect them as well. The people who are working all day, every day, and a second job, who can't possibly afford to hire a lawyer at $400 an hour, who still have their share and more of the legal issues. That's our client. On June 3rd, 1924, 17 local lawyers founded the Atlanta Legal Aid Society with the simple goal of providing law to people that need it but cannot afford it. It was one of the very first stable institutions in the Southeast to provide legal services for the poor. E. Smythe Gambrell, just two years out of Harvard Law School, became its first president. There was not widespread and broad support for legal aid at the time my father and these others were doing this. Uh, it didn't exist in a lot of cities. Uh, it didn't exist in any but one law school. The work was done by individual lawyers just taking time off from their private practice. And then over time, uh, they were able to raise enough money to hire a small staff. Smythe was president of the state bar. He was president of the American Bar Association. He went through more lawyers than Sherman did through Georgians. He got members of the organized bar involved with legal aid at a very early point in time. And I don't think legal aid would be what it is today without the support of the Atlanta bar. Machinations of unscrupulous and usurious moneylenders in whose net honest, hard-working laborers are enmeshed were revealed Wednesday by J.L.R. Boyd, general counsel for the Atlanta Legal Aid Society at the Henry Grady Hotel. One of the community fund's most worthy members is the Atlanta Legal Aid Society. Each year, it has enabled many to file proper suits and obtain justice. In the mid-60s, there was a change to get federal funding, and that changed the whole ball game. The, the program went from like five lawyers to like 20 lawyers in, in a couple of years. The big wave of expansion that happened here at Atlanta Legal Aid happened starting about 68, after the big civil rights push in the South. 
What triggered it for me was when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I said, I've got to use my law degree to do something. I came along right at the time when they were now starting to hire uh, these idealistic lawyers right out of law school. Being a little country boy from Mississippi, I was thrown in here with all these uh, raging Bolsheviks and uh, learned a lot about social issues. You sort of had this, this crew of um, hippie wannabes, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And um, probably the folks who were supervising us were the real hippies. I, you, you look at the pictures and you have to wonder sometimes. There was a lot of stuff out there easily challengeable. In the early 70s, the eviction statute that then existed in the state of Georgia. A landlord took out a warrant. Uh, a tenant had a right to defend only if it posted a year's rent in advance. In one year, there were something like 16,000 dispossessory warrants taken in Fulton County that year and 12 answers. Not 12,000, 12. There was a particular provision in Georgia law that you cannot withhold rent, depending, doesn't matter what condition your place you're living in, it could have rats. And if the landlord didn't repair it, you couldn't withhold rent because if you withheld rent until he repaired, you'd be evicted. The Atlanta Housing Authority was perhaps the most frequent foe of Atlanta Legal Aid. Legal Aid and the Housing Authority used to have weekly encounters over housing issues. There were a lot of predators in poor communities. Legal services started taking on those predators and improved the quality of life. And the philosophy is one of making the community whole. Really aggressive legal aid services and civil matters was just starting up in the late 60s, early 70s, and really was put on the road by Richard Nixon, who got Congress to establish the Legal Services Corporation. That's a fairly conservative idea that people can have lawyers. That changed shortly after uh, Ronald Reagan became president. And in fact, the first Reagan budget cut legal services monies by about a third. Federal funding came with its price, and the price was controversy and always the possibility of loss of that funding. Steve started this idea of getting contributions from the law firms in Atlanta. I always said we would never be able to raise money year in and year out from lawyers. They wouldn't do it. And we are now going into about the 28th year of that campaign with major support from lots of places in the legal community. Our support of legal aid is as important as paying the electric bill and the rent and our salaries for our people. But we'll continue to provide an open heart and open arms to refugees seeking freedom from communist domination and from economic deprivation brought about primarily by uh, Fidel Castro and his government. These people are illegally in this country. They can, by law, be confined by the attorney general indeterminately. In 1980, Fidel Castro allowed thousands of people to leave Cuba to seek asylum in the United States. This included some people who were suspected or convicted of criminal acts. Many of these so-called Mariel Cubans, having come from the port of Mariel in Cuba, were detained in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary without recourse to due process. By 1982, you had <clears throat> somewhere between 1,500 and, and 2,000 people locked up in Atlanta with the Reagan administration saying, these people don't have any rights. There was a lot of litigation, and that was actually led by Debbie Abel. We had some 2,000 who were incarcerated at the Atlanta Penitentiary, and they all filed habeas corpus petitions uh, in Spanish. Judge Shube called me one day, and he asked if the Atlanta Bar would provide representation for the Cuban detainees. The next step was a visit to my friend Steve Gottlieb at the Atlanta Legal Aid Office, and as he tells the story, uh, here was the conservative Republican bar president coming to Atlanta Legal Aid asking for money.
It was a team effort and it involved many, many people and, and hundreds of volunteer lawyers. Just, just one second, Mr. Leshaw. Are you putting drug offenses, the selling of crack, the selling of cocaine as a non-serious crime? Of course not. Of course it's a serious crime. But what I'm suggesting is that each case should be reviewed individually. Let me make my point, please. There are people here who have wives and children in this country, who have American citizen wives, American citizen children. They may have committed a crime, and they may have been paroled. Some of these people copped pleas. They weren't even sentenced to jail. Others well, were paroled. They anything. served their time. Doesn't it seem fair that you would give this person a but fair hearing before already, separating them from their hearing. wives and children but forever? In November of 1987, the U.S. government made a deal with Castro to begin deporting some of the Mariel detainees to Cuba. Word came out, we're going to start sending people back. These people who were locked up said, wait a minute, we've done what we were told, we behaved, we've been through these reviews, now you're telling us you're going to send us back. Good evening, welcome to Crossfire. Not since the missiles of October has a Cuban crisis so dominated the American news. After five days of rioting and torching, 2,400 Cuban detainees still hold 121 hostages in two prisons. Part of the deal ending the riots was that the detainees were going to go through a new review system, a more formal review system. Those who were approved for release would be released. Those who weren't would either be held or they would be returned to Cuba. Gary Leshaw is credited with convincing the Cubans the agreement was the best they'd received. Uh, they wanted fair hearings, they wanted fair treatment, which they haven't gotten uh, over the last seven or eight years. And they didn't ask for a federal judge. They didn't ask for the ACLU. They didn't ask for a, a Cuban official. They wanted a legal aid attorney to come in and negotiate on their behalf and to talk to them because they trusted him. Working in legal aid is kind of like working in a legal emergency room. And that is everything that comes in is a sometime for emergency. The thing that I liked about working at legal aid was the fact that I was dealing with real people and could make a difference in somebody's life. They are so well qualified and they have so much zeal to do what they do and they get paid so little for the work that they do. I just wonder where these people come from. They've done some great things. They've made some folks uncomfortable over the years. And that's what they're supposed to do, is to make folks uncomfortable, to rethink, to pause and say, are we doing the right thing here? You can capture an individual's dimples, their smile, their eyes in just a matter of minutes. And it's, it's just amazing to me. There's a big problem when a person has some cognitive limitations and some emotional upsets, you know, and gets a little bit out of control and ends up in a hospital. They tend to get a psychiatric label. It, it, it's your typical one flew over the cuckoo's nest atmosphere. All these linoleum floors and the long halls with the doors. And the residents just are standing there. She was in restraints, seclusion, forced medication, you know, held down. Uh, a lot of violent, frightening stuff happened to her. It make you feel like you're going to die. When I was in the hospital, I felt like I was in a low box and you couldn't go north, you couldn't go east, and you couldn't go west. I was stuck. Atlanta Legal Aid filed suit in federal court on behalf of Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson. The Olmstead case made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The High Court ruled that states are required to place persons with mental disabilities in a community setting, rather than a mental institution, when treatment professionals believe community placement is appropriate and when it can be reasonably accommodated. Almost everybody in the right setting can do just what Lois is doing. It's almost always cheaper. 
she was really coming to her own as far as uh, you know being happy, being being an artist, uh, having her artwork uh, on display and uh, exhibits. I've seen her really, um, re really flourish uh, with living in the community. I love my home. If you have the right professional help and a lawyer, you can make it. I think uh, the general perception of poor people in the country is that they're poor because they're lazy, because they don't want to work a job. I, I, I've always found that kind of fantastic, uh, that, that someone would say, no, I don't want to work a job. I'd rather get 207 a month in TANF. All we're doing is trying to enforce the laws that benefit poor people and mostly that protect low-income people. Most of them don't want to ask for help. They try to solve the situation on their own before they realize that they really do need help. Really, in order to represent a client well, you have to understand the client. Most middle class folks are completely amazed to hear that people live on this kind of money. The eligibility limit for Atlanta Legal Aid Services is the person has to be at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. I didn't realize how expensive it is to be poor. The people who are in poor neighborhoods tend to have the grocery stores near them are more expensive. They have less access to any sort of credit, so they pay a lot more for the credit. It's just everything piles on top of each other to make it much more expensive. There was this industry, a predatory industry, called the subprime mortgage loan business, which uh, targeted people's homes for very bad loans. Loans that, especially during the, this last decade, ended up in foreclosure. It is a defensive kind of work. Um, you, you almost have a mental image that you're putting a barrier around the house so these people can't come and get it and take it and put the homeowners out on the street. Preying on poor people is big business in America. Mr. Hawkins' case is a classic example of what we call predatory mortgage lending. The process is often initiated with a home improvement company offering to fix the home of a elderly person who has lower income and hasn't been able to fix their house for a while. An expert that we called in said it was worth $7,000. They charged $13,700. He doesn't have the cash to pay for the home improvement work, so they arranged a mortgage loan. And he could not make the payments. One day he called me and said he couldn't buy food. And when he told me that, I said, stop paying. <laughs> They can foreclose on his house, sell it out from under him, buy it at the foreclosure sale, and pay off the mortgage. And that's what they do. They can do more with a pen and paper than a thief can do with a loaded gun. They just went right to work for me. They stepped in there and got me out of bondage. They really worked on my case, and they kept at it. They stuck with me like chewing gum, and they're still sticking. We see the bad economy coming a million miles away long before the middle class sees it. There's something going on and you guys need to start paying attention to it because it's coming and sure enough it always does. In 2000, Bill Brennan went to Congress and told Congress that if they allowed Fannie and Freddie to get into the subprime mortgages that it would snowball and if there was any sort of dip in the economy that you would have a huge recession and that Congress would have to bail them out. And that's exactly what happened. This crisis, which was definitely caused by the subprime mortgage meltdown and the, and the fact that those securities that were issued, more and more of the loans brought into the pools were made to people who couldn't possibly afford to pay. Uh, and they just kept it going and it, you know, causing the eventual collapse of the housing market and then the entire American economy and the worldwide economy. It would have been stopped if they'd listened. <laughs> the 
she is like the strength of my life. She was the only reason that I wanted to keep going on, that I wanted to keep living. We have a lady that came from the Dominican Republic. She married a guy who have been here for a number of years. They have a little baby. He abused her real badly all through their marriage. If somebody is a victim of family violence, then their ability to bargain on their own behalf or protect their own interests or the interests of the children that they're looking out for are really limited. So they really need an advocate so that they're not at the mercy of the person that's been abusing them. I thought that I had no choice. I thought that I, would, that I, that I had to do everything he was asking me to do to, for me to keep my baby with me because that was the only thing I was scared of, that he was going to take my baby away from me and I would never see him back. Finally, after a long time, we were able to get her um, a divorce and right now uh, she's been helped to become a, a permanent resident. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was a law school in Dominican Republic. One day I'm going to be an attorney <laughs> and I'll be able to help people like they just did to me. Access to a lawyer can sometimes be a matter of life or death. Atlanta Legal Aid helps people with cancer, ALS, and AIDS who suffer employment discrimination. It also helps people who are denied disability benefits or are refused coverage for crucial medical treatment. There are so many social services and medical services that are offered to cancer patients, um, but legal services are not incorporated into their care. I tell the story of a 43-year-old woman named Janice who was hanging on to life weeks longer than expected. Janice revealed that she had an 11-year-old daughter who she wanted to leave in the care of her sister. And her daughter's father was unfit to take care of her. And the social worker called me and asked me if I could prepare the documents to make Janice's wishes known. And it was really unbelievable to see the sense of peace and calm that instantly washed over her. And I held her hand and I told her everything was going to be okay, that her daughter was going to be cared for. And I left and I later returned to my office and I received a call from Janice's sister, who she had named as the guardian, thanking me for putting Janice at ease because she told me that she passed away shortly after I left. There was a case of a child that needed a heart transplant, and certain things needed to happen legally for the child to have the heart transplant. It's a partnership with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, Atlanta Legal Aid, and Georgia State Law School. We provide legal services to low-income patients and their families at Children's. And the transplant team recommended that the mother needed to give guardianship to the, the grandmother because the mother understood that she was not financially stable to care for a child who had a heart transplant. And so we discussed an emergency modification of custody and that entailed filing a petition and getting a consent order. There was also a biological father in the picture. However, he was in jail, and so I went to the jail to get his consent because because it was an emergency situation, I did not want there to be a holdup um, with the court system in regards to notifying the biological father. This was also the same day that a huge snowstorm was coming into Atlanta, and so I was trying to fight the snowstorm and I made it to the jail and had the deputies there deliver the paperwork to the biological father and because he'd been speaking to the mother, he signed off on everything as well. And the child had the transplant. The child's alive. It's got a heart, a beating heart. And think about what an incredible thing that is. Ch Children's Healthcare of Atlanta is inviting lawyers into the hospital. The power of a legal document that we can do routinely, that we have the expertise to do routinely, and that we can get to help someone, it was just profound.
I grew up in the South, and at the time when I was in my early teens, there still was separate water fountains, and there was separate entrance to theaters. And if there is no faith in the system, the legal system, that there is no faith in getting wrongs redressed, it's a severe blow. If people don't feel like there's a level playing field going in, it permeates their thinking about the entirety of the process, meaning are they invited to the table? People have to believe that they stand with equal dignity to everyone else in order to believe the whole of the system. We have this sort of existential idea that you've got to fight injustice. That's all very important, but what is often in your personal life and as a person way more important to you is how you've helped one individual client. As Churchill said, one makes a living with what one gets, but one makes a life with what one gives. An investment in legal aid and protecting the underprivileged is not an expense, it's an investment. If we can raise that level of poverty, then we will raise the level of all of us. Legal aid represents the best of my profession. And uh, we're so blessed to have them. Legal aid quite simply does justice.